Welcome back. My name is Roberto Schaefer. I'm a professor at the Energy Planning Program at the Federal University of Rio in Brazil. And we are going to have a very interesting session here. I'm going to be the moderator. Uh, and the name of the session is Moving Beyond Fossil Fuels in Latin America. We have four presenters, and two presenters are going to be focusing more on carbon issues, on coal issues, and two presenters more on uh, natural gas and oil. It's interesting because you have the focus here is Latin America, a region that's very rich in fossil fuels, but very poor in terms of economic development and social issues, political issues. So we have a kind of, let's say, interesting issue here, which is very different from some discussion we had yesterday when we were focused on, for example, the case of Norway, the case of California, when, let's say, uh, keeping oil or coal in the ground has a completely different connotation than in the case of Latin America, where some of these countries are counting very much on those resources for their economic development. So it's interesting to see this, let's say, the perspective that we're going to have here, as opposed to the ones that we have yesterday. So let's start by inviting Andrea Carolina Cardoso Diaz from Universidad del Magdalena. And uh, Andrea, you have the floor, and she's going to be focused more on the issue of coal in Colombia. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I have to thank you to the organizer to uh, such a nice opportunity. The, actually, this is my first time in this conference, and, and my first time in, in Oxford. Um, today, I'm going to present the work that I'm doing with um, Catherine Farrell and Roman, Roman Mendelevich, who is in this room. And in this work, we analyze the path dependencies of uh, current coal use and supply, the irreversibility of, uh, of the social and ecological impacts of this extraction, this extraction and, and also the cost shifting of these ecological and social impacts. And what, uh, what the con our contribution is, uh, uh, this work highlight uh, the additional uncompensated costs uh, that can be expected to rise as a consequence of uh, budget emission of, uh, of uh, carbon. Uh, and you, we use the example of Colombia to explain this. So let me start. Uh, so this is the title of our presentation. Unexpected effects on the mission carbon budget, the Colombian course resource course. Uh, so many of you already know the, the work of uh, McGlade and Ekin, who, uh, who estimate that more than 80% of the coal should keep it in the ground. And, and these uh, limited resources uh, open up two questions. Uh, first, um, how will decision be made regarding which coal is to stay in the ground? And what argument will be considered in that decision process? And how will the limited resources uh, uh, be located to meet the exceed demand of the emerging economies? So it's, uh, it's to be expected that uh, high quality deposits of, uh, of coal be prioritized uh, such a Colombian coal. Here you, you can see that Colombia has a very, very high calorific value and also a low sulfur content and also low ash, uh, ash content and as well a very low transportation cost. So uh, Colombia with a cost competitive uh, and high energy content uh, can be expected to experience uh, continue strong demand for their reserves. Um, so this is uh, so, sorry. This is the first of the elements to the Colombian coal uh, resource cost. Is that based on private economic co uh, cost, Colombian coal is competitive on the international steam uh, coal market. But where uh, where does this come? Uh, this economic advantage come from? Are there su subsidies? Are there liabilities and compensated liabilities? In a previous board, I estimated the social environmental liabilities of a coal mining in one of the regions in Colombia, in Cesar, uh, and I identified these social environmental liabilities as uh, the uncompensated damage 
produced by coal mining in this region. Here is the local uncompensated damage that identified the regional the, the damages. And, and I have to say that as economists, I do not believe in market. Actually, I believe uh, in the market failure uh, in order that they, the market doesn't include these uncompensated liabilities, these uncompensated damages. And in my work, I estimated the economic valuation of, uh, of the liabilities uh, that are carried uh, every extracted ton of coal uh, in, in Cesar carry uh, um, uh, carries uh, uh, environmental liabilities estimated in that in, in that value and here we can see that uh, the, the maximum share is due to the um, to the pollution of air water and soil and also due to the public health laws including the, the public the health of the workers and the health of the communities and, and what is amazing about these, these resources is the environmental liabilities are much higher than the coal market price and even the royalties, which is only 10% of the coal market. So the question is, why not leave the coal in the hole if uh, the environmental liabilities are higher than the, the market price of coal? So this is be, become the second element of the elements of a Colombian coal resources course. This cost advantage is based on of a, of a externalization of the, those liabilities, those are compensated damage. And what are the long-term economic costs? Uh, here is the, uh, the results of a um, uh, preliminary research uh, conducted by Michael Kostner, which is a student by a, a Roman st a student. And he found that uh, the local, uh, local resources course in, in La Guajira and Cesar, which is uh, the, the coal mining regions on the Caribbean region in Colombia, and the, he, he's found that there is direct economic impacts and uh, related with the comparative slow growth, a lot of dependence, dependency of, uh, of this coal production. GDP follows resources price volatility and the, the industrialization and price inflation and also indirect impacts related with corruptions, weak institutions, uh, civil conflicts, and as well uh, a lot of problems with the basic needs in these regions. So this is uh, the third uh, element of the Colombian Core Resources course, the lack of sustainability and diverse economic development are inter intergenerational costs of mining. These three aspects constitute what we call the Colombian Core Resource course. In short, the, this Colombian Core Resource uh, is that the poor sell chips, but as well the, the, localized, the localized externalities are disconnected with the international uh, revenues. And, and also the contradiction between avoiding global externalities and creating local ones implies the uh, dirty future for Colombia in a world that is becoming cleaner. So the recommendation of this is that future international climate policy needs to account these uh, externalities. And also pure cost-based policy needs to include a normative agreement to address the resources course uh, symptoms. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm part of a research group uh, from Italy and uh, we worked uh, in uh, Ecuador too. And uh, we are geographer and so in this uh, presentation uh, um, my research group uh, worked more in this part of the defining unburnable carbon areas. While our counterpart, the, our colleagues from Ecuador, Carlos Rarrea and uh, Maria Mormis, work more in this part about the sustainable transition to fossil fuel, some sustainable alternatives to fossil fuel. So, uh, I think that is not necessary to explain uh, again the unburnable carbon concept. Everybody knows, knows it, I think. I want to focus, uh, as geographer, I want to focus in this part the where part. 
because uh, McGlendin and Atkins in their uh, milestone um, paper uh, set some targets at a uh, regional level. Like uh, for uh, uh, South America, they set uh, the target for uh, Central and South America based on the estimation of reserves. But uh, the, no, well, till now, that uh, if uh, I don't uh, be equivocated, uh, nobody um, tried to explain where to leave the fossil under soil. Why this? Uh, because uh, the underground, the um, um, unburnable carbon concept is not uh, um, very important only for the climate change uh, challenge, but is important because uh, above ground there are a lot of different uh, possible social environmental impacts on the social ecological system, like deforestation, gases emission, noise and vibration, and so on. So, and uh, because of this, we, we, are, uh, we, are, we focus on the where. And uh, this is uh, the Yasuni ITT, I think that uh, this is a very famous initiative to leave uh, oil, to keep the oil in the soil in the Yasuni National Park in Ecuador that uh, unluckily failed, but uh, they tried to uh, ask for an international compensation fund uh, to leave uh, uh, the oil of this uh, uh, oil block that is uh, uh, partially overlapped with uh, the Yasuni National Park. This uh, um, project failed, but uh, um, the concept, the idea of Yasunization, so to leave the, keep the oil under, in the soil, is still uh, um, an important issue in, the, um, in, in Ecuador and I think now all over the world. There are a lot of NGOs and so on that uh, are trying to go on with the, this idea. So why Ecuador? This is the study area because it's a mega diverse country. Uh, it's very important as a, uh, like, uh, it's one of the most uh, important uh, country in the world as biodiversity and uh, for uh, its cultural diversity too. And because is an extractive and exporter country. Um, yes, uh, Ecuador has a long history of oil exploitation, mainly in the uh, Ecuador, Ecuadorian Amazon region, the RAE, that is this part, and that is the most uh, biodiversity, um, it's the most the area of Ecuador with most biodiversity and a lot of indigenous people. So we focus uh, the, our study in this part, uh, and the aims of our study is the, to map hydrocarbon reserves antiquities, uh, the, which overlap and impact bio biological and culturally diverse areas in the RAE. And based on this, we try to identify geographical criteria to define unburnable carbon areas. And uh, then uh, our, um, our colleagues in Ecuador try to explore the possible sustainable alternatives toward a transition from oil extraction in, uh, in Ecuador and its Amazon. Uh, the, met the methods, uh, the main methods that we use, uh, there are different uh, methods that can be used to try to define vulnerable carbon areas. We try to use uh, uh, GIS, so geographic information technologies, and the spatial multi-criteria decision analysis. So we try to, uh, we collect and select a lot of uh, different uh, um, spatial data uh, related to oil and gas, uh, features, social, infrastructure, environment, and so on. And we process this data in GIS. And uh, uh, we try to define uh, um, some criteria to, um, to run the, uh, the analysis. We select this criteria with a participatory simulation within the research group. It was uh, quite funny because, you know, I was the, I'm the oil and gas uh, boss, another one was the, um, the environmental NGO boss, and so on. So, yes, my criteria is bigger than you, no, my, your criteria is bigger than mine, so on. It was uh, quite funny. And uh, we define some the weights uh, and if these criteria uh, were a cost or a gain. I go on. So, for example, the analysis unit for this um, multi-criteria analysis was the oil block. And uh, we, for example, the uh, criteria for the reserves infrastructure, we use the reserves uh, based on the report uh, of the Secretaria General de Hidrocarburos de Ecuador of uh, 2017 of uh, the presence of wells. As you can see here, the wells the present pipelines, uh, oil platform, and so on. So we create uh, three macro criteria. We create one macro criteria with the, this uh, kind of uh, 
um, features. So the uh, better oil blocks is the oil block with a lot of reserves, with a lot of wells infrastructure to take oil. And uh, another macro criteria, macro criteria is socio-cultural, so with indigenous territories and contact indigenous people in tangible zone, uh, touristic sites, and so on. Uh, so the better block uh, as a socio-cultural aspect is the block with um, most part of uh, indigenous territories and so on, and the ecological conservation and impact macro criteria with, uh, uh, with cost, uh, oil spills and oil pools, uh, with gain protected areas, ecosystem types, uh, and other uh, aspects. So the best uh, uh, oil block is uh, the, uh, the oil block with uh, uh, most with uh, a lot of protected areas and the less oil spills, for example. We combine all these three macro criteria, and so uh, we um, run uh, the uh, last multi-criteria analysis with the reserving infrastructures as gain, and with the ecological conservation, the social cultural as cost. And we try to uh, make three, uh, three different uh, simulations changing the relative weights between these three macro criteria. So, for example, here we have the different output maps for the, if uh, we uh, priori prioritize the social cultural aspect, so we put uh, a very big uh, weight for the social cultural uh, macro criteria. If we uh, prioritize the ecological conservation and if we, if we prioritize the macro criteria, uh, the research infrastructures. As you can see, this is uh, near zero are the blocks that should stay where the oil should stay underground. And near one, we have the blocks that could go on uh, with extraction. And uh, for example, you can see that here, this is the part where uh, the, um, there is a, the, is the most famous, the most important part for oil extraction in uh, Ecuador. Here, there is the, due to the presence of a lot of wells, infrastructures, and the reserves, uh, we, with a multi-criteria multi analysis in all three scenarios, the uh, exploitation should, could go on, maybe with best practice, because these are the part with uh, a lot of oil spills, gas flares, and so on. And this part, uh, mainly, mainly here, around this, that is the intangible zone for uh, uncontacted indigenous people, should stay underground. Interesting is this block, because this block is the block of the uh, in the, the initiative Yasuni ITT. And it's interesting because, look, for the uh, social cultural uh, macro criteria, it should stay underground because of the presence of in the uncontacted indigenous people. For the um, ecological and conservation, uh, is in the middle. And for the, but for the, if uh, we prioritize the uh, fossil fuel production, it should be extracted because there are a lot of reserves on the ground. So the three different vision. And uh, some conclusion. So we spoke about where to uh, leave oil under soil, not based only in uh, the classical criteria like uh, economical, financial, uh, geological, uh, and so on, but based on the biodiversity and the cultural aspect uh, above ground. Now we, so we can try to, um, to present, uh, we tr I try to present some, uh, um, some idea to, for the transition away from oil, an oil-based society. So uh, and at a local scale, we can uh, try to develop a small and medium scale tourism, uh, zero deforestation, best practice in the remaining oil extraction. So where we have to uh, extract in this transition uh, uh, period, uh, we can do it but with best practice, and uh, uh, try to improve the biodiversity conservation, cultural and human diversity protection. And, uh, okay, go on, because I have very few minutes. And uh, how to finance, uh, wh where we find the money, because we can't uh, ask to developing country to, to keep the oil under the soil if we don't create uh, an international compensation fund that could uh, be uh, developed with direct international contribution for energy transition uh, and uh, with equivalent contribution with um, direct investment activities and sectors with scholarships, grants, technology transfer, and so on. So only some conclusion uh, concerning the multi mainly the multi-criteria analysis. 
Well, okay, everybody said the importance to put the unburnable carbon in the climate and energy agenda. We think that it's important to investigate methodology and criteria to spatially define where to promote the ozonization politics and the spatial uh, multi-criteria decision analysis could be one. And, uh, uh, but uh, we have to take it with careful. We, uh, we have to uh, remember that this is, this is part of uh, um, of a process, of a participatory process, of a decision-making process. And we, uh, if we want to do it, we have to um, take care about the special data. The availability, quality, and reliability of special data is very hard to find special data, mainly related to oil and gas activities. The reserves is almost impossible to understand if they are the, the real reserves or not. And then, then the choice of criteria, the weights of criteria, and the criteria as a cost or gain. This is the importance of participatory processes, expert consultation, and social validation. Because you can, if you change a criteria, you know the results change. And uh, uh, so it could help in, uh, on where and how to promote uh, um, environmental carbon area initiatives. Grazie per l'attenzione. Everybody, it's a great pleasure to be here in a session about Latin America, something I think we haven't seen much, so really happy to be a part of this. Um, so yeah, my, my initial submission and the title says I'm going to talk about both Colombia and South Africa, but given the session's uh, title, I'll be focusing mainly on Colombia here, and maybe in the discussions we can, we can open, feel free to ask questions uh, also later. So this presentation is based on the work uh, I've been doing with colleagues at SCI, uh, Karina Barke and Aaron Attridge, uh, this March uh, in, in the main coal producing area in Colombia, around Valle du Par and the Cesar department. Um, uh, and uh, we did lots of interviews with, with a series of stakeholders, and we also hold a workshop on, on coal's future in Bogota around that time together with Grupo Leira. So that's the base for, for today's uh, presentation. So from uh, uh, Andrea's presentation earlier, we can see that um, there are um, important reasons why um, coal extraction represents risks. Uh, to, 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 the, to, to, to Colombia and to Colombian people. Um, we haven't talked much about that until now, but Colombia, for those who don't know, is one of the major uh, thermal coal exporters, and it's a country that's very interesting in the sense that they use very little of this coal, uh, their, their coal production uh, domestically. Most of it is for export. There are lots of infrastructure bottlenecks to access uh, the Asian market, so going forward, it's... Um, increasing uncertainty again uh, in, in terms of uh, future markets for exports. So you have a, a context where betting on coal, um, coal mining for future development is an increasingly risky strategy. Uh, and at the, from an external perspective, and at the same time from a domestic perspective, increasing uh, opposition against large-scale extractive industries in general, and I'll be, I'll be getting back to that. But in that context, uh, uh, the, the, the question of how to prepare for a coal decline that could uh, come much uh, quicker than anticipated by, by policy is an important one, and we've seen in the previous session uh, how important it's from a national perspective, the question of revenues, and, and, and Glada and her, and her panel um, uh, talked a lot about that, Iveta also yesterday, but also at local level, and maybe also mainly at local level. Then we're talking about regional economic development, jobs, who's going to deal with environmental rehabilitation, uh, there are questions around identities and cultural changes, and, and, and what, what's going to happen around that. So, uh, here I'll talk about two main things. One is how is the future of coal perceived uh, uh, in the main coal producing area and also what is being done to prepare for uh, a potentially rapid decline in the coal industry. And here I should do one more precision is that in Colombia, coal mining is really part, uh, not part, is actually a key pillar of an extractivist uh, economic development model uh, and that has strong implication for how the sector is governed. Um, and therefore also on how much and, and um, how we can think about planning coal transition in the country. So who is working on planning for after coal uh, in Colombia? So far there's been very little um, debate, public debate on the possible 
uh, implication of uh, faster coal decline than anticipated. There is no uh, policy measures about anticipating and navigating coal transitions. Um, there is a little mention in the, uh, by the Treasury, so the Treasury is starting to look, to look uh, into this question, but that's really um, very low key uh, so far. And when you look at the planning, um, the planning exercise that was made by the CESAR planning department in 2011 around the future for the region and the visions for the region, none of the four scenarios contemplates um, a potential significant decline in coal production. So basically, the vision is locking in uh, more coal for development. Now, it was done in 2011, so that was also a time where coal prices were high and it's more difficult to think about this is going to change uh, at some point, right? So basically, who is actually planning for coal closure now is the mines, because the mines, to get their license, they need to have a closure plan uh, to start with. So um, the companies... Um, like Cerejón and Prodeco, they're uh, looking ahead and they've already announced, well, in 10, 15 years, we're, gonna, we're going out and we're starting now our process at the first stages of the closure process, a uh, process that takes 10, 15 years, right? So uh, really long-term planning and you can't see this on the policy side uh, right now. So why is it? What, what's, what's the vision about uh, coal for the future in, in these areas of the country? Um, where am I here? Yeah. So coal mining is presented as a, as a key component, as a driver of regional development in the future. That's not based on a track record of uh, development improvement in the past. That's based on other arguments, such as uh, the idea that alternative economic models are not sustainable from the perspective of local economic dynamism or local public revenues. Um, and there is a discussion also about a miner doesn't be, won't become uh, a farmer, right? And that's something that's not proper to Colombia. It's a discussion that's happening uh, in many of the coal uh, producing areas around the world. Uh, and complementary to this is the idea that there is no reason not to mine, given the benefits that coal mining can bring about if it's well done. La idea de, sorry, the idea of uh, la minería bien hecha. Right? Um, so here there are two interesting things, and we can link back to, to the discussion that have been um, taking place here earlier. That one, this full sense of control, that it's a policy decision to continue uh, mining, like you have tons of reserves and you'll be developing them forever, while in reality, well, it's dependent on, uh, on factors that are not under the control of neither local government nor national government to the, the largest extent, and past mining closure um, the history of past mining closure is really clear about the fact that most of these, these processes happen very fast and uh, resulting from external economic shocks or technolog technological changes. Uh, the other thing that's interesting around this, this narrative is, uh, again, this inev in inevitability uh, of uh, extraction, right? And we, we've seen a bit that uh, around the discourses used by the, the oil companies uh, to... to, to <coughs> to legitimize their activities and maintain the status quo. So overall, the idea of coal production decline is absent from development planning and moving away from coal is not a policy option, but it's not even a possible scenario. So that's where we are now uh, in policy. Now in Colombia, something that's very interesting is that uh, the idea that there is no better option than large scale extractive industries to drive local regional uh, development has encountered strong resistance, um, and not only in coal mining regions. So this opposition has been seen over different types of large scale mining and oil and gas extraction projects. Uh, and it's been reflected in the wave of popular referendas and uh, decisions by local governments to try to limit uh, extractive uh, development. And this really shows a much profound tension uh, between different types of economic development models in Colombia. That links very well back to the, some of the, the comments uh, we heard in the, in the previous session. So in this context, it makes sense that uh, there is no policy acknowledgement of the risks of a coal decline scenario and the need for preparing for such scenario. 
as the national government and other extractive incumbent actors attempt to normalize and naturalize extractive-led uh, development. Um, discussing what happened after coal would mean recognizing not only the possibility, but also the desirability of an alternative economic development model, because coal would not be an option anymore. So that's really a, a big tension and an obstacle also in, in, in starting thinking about what happens beyond coal. And that's the last slide. Um, so there is definitely a strong narrative around the role of coal for future development uh, in, in, in these areas of, of Colombia, and that's a strong push uh, by, by the national government, uh, of course. But at the same time, there are also what uh, we may um, call seeds of change. Um, when talking with subnational and national planning authorities and local business associations and other stakeholders, like there is uh, really um, increasing agreement that this question is relevant and important to address as soon as possible um, outside of the politicized spaces, right? Um, and here, um, I'm not sure where it comes from. Is it because companies have now publicly uh, talk, talked about we're, we're closing soon? Um, or it's because of the impacts of the low price uh, around the, the lowering price of coal since, since 2013, 2014. But it's happening. A big issue, though, is that um, there is really a lack of examples to guide discussions and visions around what to do after coal. So here I, there is a big uh, place for researchers to, to work more. Uh, there is some of the work done by the coal, tra coal transition uh, project but that's mainly in, in, in developed, it's only in developed uh, countries. So in that mm -hmm. sense, there is much more to do. We talked about the specific structural barriers to transition that, that can be found in developing countries, and that's something that requires much more attention. Now, the second thing is that the literature on social mobilization against extractive industry uh, argues that subnational authorities and communities have felt increasingly empowered by decisions of the Constitutional Court regarding their role in deciding about how to use their land and what type of development to pursue. So there's been this big uh, fight through litigation around the role <coughs> of local authorities and communities in deciding about whether or not uh, large-scale extractive industry can, can, can take place on, on, their, on their land. And that's also a great starting point to have discussions at local level about what comes next or what comes instead uh, of fossil fuel extraction, right? Um, and the last point I wanted to make was about the peace process. So really in Colombia and in other places around the world, uh, coal transition or fossil fuel transition will happen within broader societal transition. And in Colombia, it happens to be uh, the implementation of peace process, right? So that adds a layer of complexity, but that also opens up um, uh, opportunities in the sense that it provides space for imagination and for thinking creatively about what comes next. Um, and uh, also actual institutions whose mandate and, and, and organization is really uh, thinking towards rethinking rural development in, in, in Colombia. And it's also an example of multiple societal actors at different levels getting together, coordinating in making a plan and, and, and trying to, to to coordinate effort towards uh, um, a different uh, society. And that's exactly what's needed also for uh, navigating coal transition or fossil fuel transition um, um, around the world. And this is an interesting, actually, governance question because the governance of mining has been increasingly um, centralized at national level, very few agencies and ministry uh, managing the whole governance of the sector. Uh, in South Africa, South Africa it's, uh, they're even in charge of the environmental impact assessments. I mean, it's like crazy concentration. While navigating the transition and, and managing that will require involvement across all scales. And it's about the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Water and <laughs> the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And um, really like making the energy transition, a matter that is relevant to all these actors, is, is something key in the process. So on this relatively positive uh, note, <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will stop there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very happy to, to be here once again in, in, in Oxford, uh, trying to, to say a few words on moratoria on, 
oil and gas exploration and uh, extraction in, in Latin America. It's just like um, having a child at home that developed uh, an addiction to, to cookies. Not only he craves for cookies, but he has a cupboard full of cookies. Or well, maybe there, there are not so many remaining, but we know that in hidden drawers in the house, there must be lots of cookies there. And we, we start telling him or her that, uh, no way. Due to health reasons, uh, overweight or uh, whatever, uh, um, the, not only he cannot have the cookies, but he is not allowed even to look for cookies in the house. <laughs> so, okay, that's it. <laughs> so the, the normal reaction is, well, yeah, that's Latin America. <laughs> I, I know exactly what's going to happen. And the striking fact is that uh, we have a few examples, maybe limited, maybe, okay, not so many. But uh, there, there are examples of, of uh, moratoria in, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. The first one I will not delve into. It's uh, Daniele's uh, Yasuni ITT. <laughs> From my point of view, it was bound to fail. It was bound to fail because it would create a, a, a precedent. If somebody says, Either you pay something or I extract my fossil fuels from, uh, from the ground and eventually they, they will burn it into the atmosphere. Uh, I, I wonder what would happen if other so-called developing countries, uh, big producers of oil, would ask for the same treatment such as uh, Saudi Arabia or Venezuela, they both have reserves um, that may amount uh, over 34 times Ecuador's, 34 times. So there, there's not enough gold in, the, in this planet to pay for uh, everybody wanting to, to, to keep uh, the the fossil fuel in the, in the ground. We, we, we may help them, we may encourage them, we may do lots of things, positive action, but uh, the, the way it's framed uh, is, is not conducive to a, a general solution. In fact, as, as far as I know, uh, Jasuni is the, the only attempt to, to get compensation for that. The, the other three cases are very simple. The Costa Rica. Uh, Costa Rica has uh, a temporary, that's in, in, in fact, when, when we speak of moratorium, it, it's by definition something that is postponed. It's not uh, forever. They, they had a, a, a moratorium. Uh, that uh, was uh, set up by President uh, uh, Chinchilla and uh, Minister René Castro. It uh, ended uh, a year ago, I think, and it was, it, it, it was uh, again extended until 2021. A magic figure in Costa Rica's history because uh, this is the 200th anniversary of independence. And this is when Costa Rica intends or, or said if they would like to uh, be carbon neutral, which is utopian. It, it, it's not going there. You, you see the NDC it doesn't say anything about uh, achieving that. But it's very useful. And it's, it's really a, it provides many people there with a leverage. To, to take uh, climate action. And uh, I'm quite respectful of, of this, uh, of, of this uh, policy. So, um, like in other cases, it was a hard-fought battle with public opinion. 
And uh, it, it's not an easy thing to, to just uh, say, okay, let's go for a moratorium, even if it's just for a few years. Uh, Nicaragua is, is trying to drill next to the border, or, or, or even according to the interpretation, this side of the border. And there are quarrels with, with Nicaragua on that. But, uh, okay, Costa Rica does not produce any oil so far. There is oil, but not uh, at a commercial scale. Next case would be um, Mexico. That's a heavy oil exporting country. It, it doesn't export as much as it used to. We, we exported uh, over 3 million barrels per day in the old times. Now it's below 2, two million due to the exhaustion of the super giant, uh, uh, the, the, the oil field of uh, Cantarell, for instance, that, that, that was huge uh, on, on a planet scale, but uh, it, it's, it's over now. But in any case, um, what, what happened is that uh, President Cedillo paid a visit no, Cedillo, no, that's the current one, uh, Peña Nieto. He paid a visit to the Lacandon jungle and met uh, a very good friend of mine, my former boss, Julia Carabias, the most awarded environmentalist in, in the history of Mexico, uh, recently awarded the highest degree of, uh, the, the, of the medal, Belisario Dominguez, uh, uh, granted by the Senate very few, uh, two or three women in, in Mexican history got it. And he talked uh, Peña Nieto into taking decisions that were including um, not building a, a, a very dangerous dam on the Usumacinta River, a very large river, and uh, excluding parts of uh, the territory, the, the Lacandon rainforest, from uh, oil and gas exploitation. And uh, this, believe me, this is not an administration that was extremely bold with respect to environmental policies, but uh, he said, okay, he saw the, the beauty and uh, the, the, the natural assets of, of the, the place, and uh, he, he granted the, the decree. Um, the decree was based on uh, uh, something strange in, in, in the history of legal history of, of Mexico because it was not a protected area. It's uh, within the hydrocarbons bill, there was an exclusion called Safeguard Zone, and it was the first time, and so far the last time, that this uh, legal uh, mechanism was used. Uh, and and in, not only in the Lacandon, but uh, in, in other places, I, I, will, I may be uh, using this stuff to, how does it work? Yeah, th that's it. Safeguard Zones. This is the Lacandon, but uh, there are other safeguard zones that uh, uh, I, I'm not sure that Peña Nieto was aware of who, what he was signing there. <laughs> but uh, it includes almost uh, the, the Yucatan Peninsula completely, parts of the, this is uh, heavy oil, uh, deep oil resources there. And, uh, and other places, that's uh, Ramsar, uh, wetlands, and uh, all that blue over there, let's go for it. Total exclusion of oil and gas uh, exploration and extraction. If you add up the surfaces, it uh, fetches up to slightly more than one million square kilometers. 
That's about half the, surf the, the, the land surface of the country. It's huge by any, by any standards. And uh, if you add, uh, th there were four uh, protected areas that were in, in, the same, uh, in the same degree, or, well, degrees that were uh, uh, prepared at the same day. So those, those green areas there are natural protected areas where, by law, it's also forbidden to e explore or extract oil and gas. Now you, you have a, a very complex uh, situation for a country that is traditionally an oil producer and a huge oil exporter. It's an oddity. Let's recognize that. Okay. Um, the, the, the next uh, moratorium that we find is Belize. Again, a hard fought battle with uh, the local uh, um, public opinion. And uh, it, it's it only, the, the, the moratorium in Belize is only offshore. Uh, there is um, a well, a commercial well, somewhere over there, inland. It doesn't uh, produce too much. At the height of the production, it was 5,000 barrels per day. Not more than that, and then it declined. It's about 3,000 now. But um, again, this is uh, the most outstanding diving area, perhaps, in planet Earth. This is uh, the, the blue hole here, the blue lagoon. You remember the movie? And uh, well, those are uh, part of the wonderful reef barrier. And uh, in, in this case, uh, this was part of uh, a World Heritage Site program from UNESCO. But due to the, the threat of uh, oil and gas exploration, because there is oil and gas over there, um, UNESCO put this BBRSS on the list of threatened World Heritage Sites. And, and then sent the GDs to the, the government and the Society of Belize and that was one of the reasons, on top of uh, international NGOs and local population fighting like uh, Kilkenny cats, uh, for declaring the moratorium forever. It's, it's banned, actually. In the Belize territory offshore, no more exploration, no more extraction of oil and gas. So that, that's the, the, the situation so far. Um, just let me point to finish very, uh, some, uh, some conclusions. The public opinion was the driver behind that. Uh, and the public opinion, according to the polls, have been substantially showing an interest in issues on environment and climate change. Latin America is the region in the world that is most sensitive in the public opinion to those issues. So that paves the way for, for this kind of stuff. The existence of institutions, I already uh, explained the UNESCO World Heritage here. But uh, in, in Mexico, we also have uh, Conabio, for instance, that, uh, an institution devoted to the knowledge of biodiversity and knowledge and use of biodiversity. President Obama once said that he would like to have something like that in the US. It's really an exemplary 
Russia. Now, my final point, and with that I will, I will leave my, my, my talk, is that um, in, in the decrees, except that a bit in the, in the case of Costa Rica, but uh, the decrees do not mention climate change. And some of, uh, of the uh, members of the climate change community feel uncomfortable about that. So if it's not climate change, uh, why should we be uh, supporting this or in being involved in this? I, I think it would be a, a great mistake. Not to, it's not like uh, riding somebody else's horse. Biodiversity is also our horse. We, I, I want to be very, very bold here. We have to merge the agendas to fight the climate change. We have to bring biodiversity on board. If this is what moves people, what moves decision makers, that's the way to go. And uh, in fact, uh, processes all over the world are not tailored according to the division of labor of the United Nations. I, I, I know that, uh, okay, UNFCCC is something different from uh, the Convention on Biodiversity and so on and so forth. But the, re the reality does not recognize those boundaries. And uh, the, the process is one is the same. Uh, that, that's, that's it. You, you, you cannot uh, tell somebody who is uh, reluctant to accept something because it smells bad. There are dead animals here. The, the, the landscape is completely changed. And you cannot say that uh, unless he speaks uh, climate changes, that uh, is, has a syntax set by an institution called UNFCCC, and he's unable to even pronounce uh, uh, the, you know, parts per million of GHG. He, he's, he has no right to, to, to have an, a very strong opinion. Let's forget about uh, climate changes is very good for the United Nations. That's the, the only way to go. We, we have to, to fight the battle within UNFCCC. But let's not try to fit the reality into UNFCCC because the house is too small. We need all hands on board to fight climate change. And we have to get all the instruments uh, political instruments on the table to see what is more effective and choose the most effective ones. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. I was about to offer you a cookie to you to stop, so I'm glad you stopped. So let us open the, the, the floor, floor for discussions. I think we already have one question here. And then... Okay, sorry, it's here. This lady first, and then you, okay. Hi, Megan Darby, Climate Home News. Um, I just wondered if any of you as Latin America watchers uh, had any thoughts on the Brazilian election and what's that, what that's going to mean for fossil fuel developments, um, potentially, and, and climate change in general. How are you doing? I really enjoyed the talks, Noel Healy, Salem State University. Um, so Sarah Horner closing in 2035. Um, at the moment, I haven't communicated to uh, uh, Centre Carbon, the uh, union there, the communities, about any of the plans for the closures. There's no mentions of compensation bonds, restoration bonds, closure plans. Just wondering um, if any, any of the panel could expand on the legislation and regulatory authority and what kind of discussions they're having on this, what type of leverages has been put on corporate policy to change, and how there is this mismatch between public expectations around the closures and what is actually happening on the ground. Thank you. Hi. Uh, a couple of questions or provocations. Um, 
First of all, it's striking how the pink tide governments have been really bad on this stuff. Um, and sometimes specific actions happen for peculiar reasons, like the Peña Nieto example, but that don't map to left-right politics in the region. Just a thought, if somebody wants to respond. Another thing is from the previous session, we heard from the multilateral development bank perspective and others that there's the need for national systems to be able to lead transitions. Um, and I think there's a distinction to be made in Latin American countries between the Brazils and the Mexicos and the Paraguays, Bolivias, et cetera, where we have much weaker states and states that have been where planning departments were dismantled, frankly, under neoliberalism, where you can't get a planificación territorial degree in national universities anymore. So state capacity has to be built up. And at the same time, those countries remain extremely leveraged by a multilateral system where their options are constrained, their access to technology is expensive, et cetera. So I'm wondering if, in addition to the conversation on national systems, we could also talk or hear a little bit about international constraints on doing the right thing through the channels of trade, through the channels of debt, through the channels of the existing rules of the economic game, um, et cetera. In front here, please. And then we stop and then come back to the table. Thank you, uh, Lady Lan from Chatham House. I was, um, was very struck by this idea of there not being uh, a vision for the economy without coal in Colombia. And um, I wondered uh, what you thought, uh, any, any thoughts on the discussion around what could replace the foreign exchange generated from coal exports or whether there was more thinking about um, reducing dependence on imports within Colombia. <clears throat> okay, uh, before I pass the, the question to the, to the floor here, let me pick the first question because I'm the, the only Brazilian here, so perhaps I'm in a better position to, to try to answer that. Uh, the election process in Brazil is so confusing, so problematic these days, because the, the front runner is a very far right candidate. And I think Donald Trump is would be a, would be a blast for Brazil these days because this this candidate we have in Brazil is really complicated. So because of that, the discussions are moving in a different direction. So let's say the issue of oil production for sure is not a big issue, although some candidates have mentioned that, but as my intervention in the previous session, let's say, because most of the investments in the oil sector have been made already. So basically, Brazil will become a big oil exporter. With respect to climate change, this is a little bit different. Some candidates have said, in, fa in fact, this very right-wing candidate said that he would follow Donald Trump and uh, take Brazil out of the Paris Agreement. Except for this candidate, the other candidates, let's say, would not change the, the, let's say, the Brazilian position with respect to climate change. So there's a high risk in Brazil, not because of oil or climate change, but something much worse, let's say, the, the very basic concept of democracy, the very basic concept of, let's say, what's to, 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 to live in a society that's agreeable to everybody. But so this is the Brazilian issue. Let's pass to, to other uh, members of the table here to answer more specific questions. Okay. Um, I'm going to link the second question about the, the plans of the uh, coal uh, mining company, Serrajon, who is uh, uh, going to the close mine in 2034. And I'm going to, to connect this question with the last one. What can uh, replace the dependence of coal in Colombia? So I, uh, I would like to, to tell you about an uh, initiative that uh, we are doing with other NGOs and, uh, and in uh, collaboration with my university in uh, Santa Marta. We have uh, uh, done two workshops related with the decarbonization of uh, the economy in the Caribbean region of Colombia. 
um, in Spanish, decarbonization, you know that coal in Spanish is carbon. So this carbonization is, is like a, we use this, this word like a double meaning word because uh, in, in this context, we, it's, it's very hard to say stop mining, but decarbonization sounds like a, a very good question, very good word and, and also from the academics and, and so on. So uh, our decarbonization is no uh, is no based in in uh, in the use of energy because our energy is based of hydropower, but the decarbonization in the uh, uh, decarbonization in the Colombian Caribbean region is related with close mining.s So we have been uh, done, uh, done two workshops. But uh, we have invited the, the community leaders from Cesar, from uh, Guajira, and also from Santa Marta, because uh, we have three, three main uh, departments that are affected of, uh, of coal uh, mining, extraction, and transport. And the Magdalena is the place, of Santa Marta is the place where there is the coal ports. So many communities also uh, got affected because the the coal ports. So we try to discuss with them about what, how do you see this transition? How do you plan? How do you see if, uh, for example, if tomorrow the mine closes, what is happening uh, with you? So uh, we have to discuss many aspects the role of the of the government the role of uh, of the all the actors and one of their concerns uh, we we didn't uh, think about that before uh, one of the big concerns from the community leaders is the safety for for them because in this uh, uh, conflict in the in the event we are in a peace process uh, the community leaders uh, uh, think that or feel that the, the most important thing in order to uh, continue uh, fight for their rights in this process is the safety thing to, in order to, to say and to fight what they want in this transition. So uh, this is the first thing for them. And also they said that they want to, uh, uh, to be a farmers again and also to fish and to hunting. But the, there is a problem with the new generation, with the, the young people who live in close to the mines. Actually, they don't feel like, like they are farmers. They want to, to, uh, to, be a, to become um, uh, miners. So it's a, it's a problem between the old generation and the, and the young people. They want to study. They want to go to the, to the city. They, want, they don't want to stay there. So even the, the, the communities, they, they uh, ones that the company uh, uh, compensate them, uh, compensate the, the land in order to grow, uh, to grow food there, uh, the, the young people doesn't want to stay in this, this region. Um, so we are discussing about uh, another alternatives uh, for, for them. Uh, the university is, uh, is involved in terms of, uh, of uh, education to these young people. Um, and uh, actually, uh, in February, we are, uh, we are going to do the third uh, uh, workshop in order to continue to discuss that. Uh, we try to discuss that from the bottom and, and, and take this, uh, this, um, their, their beliefs and their concerns about the, the closed mining to the government, because for the, for the coal mining companies uh, to close the mine is very technical, very technical. They doesn't include the compensation, the remediation of the impacts, <laughs> even the, the, a new economic opportunity to the communities. So we want to take their concern of the people to the government and also to the mining companies in order to be considered in the process. We have uh, like a 16 years to do that. So we, this, this transition, this energy transition uh, discussion is very new in Colombia, very new. And, and as I presented, I am very skeptical to this process because uh, uh, Colombian coal is starting to, to, to demand because the high quality 
uh, to increase the demand uh, of an uh, emerging economy like a Turkey. Turkey is the, is the main, uh, uh, the, the principal, uh, uh, in, in the principal coal uh, imported uh, of, of Colombian coal importer. So I'm, I'm skeptical to to this uh, this transition in Colombia. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. Well, I'm not an expert uh, about the uh, political situation in Ecuador. Uh, in Italy, we had Berlusconi and uh, it's enough. But uh, if you remember the, um, the, one, the first or the second map that I showed, you can, if you remember, all the northern part of Amazon is under exploitation. And uh, you remember, all the uh, central and southern part of Ecuador is under bidding. All, all that blocks in the central and northern and southern part in uh, yellow, I think, are oil biddings. So are blocks under bidding uh, since uh, 2012, I think. So I think that it's clear what the government wants for Ecuador. They want to go on with the extractive. And uh, more, um, they started in recent years to promote the mining exploitation in, equal, in uh, the Amazon too. So the situation is to go on with extractive industries and go on with the exportation of these uh, uh, raw materials. And um, what about transition? I think that uh, it's very important uh, if you want to uh, speak uh, about transition in developing country uh, to promote the cooperation between developed and developing countries, as the Paris Agreement said, they say that uh, uh, if you want to go on, uh, we need uh, uh, cooperation and maybe international funds uh, or other kinds of, uh, um, of activities uh, uh, and cooperation between developed and development countries uh, uh, could help uh, to um, try to promote uh, other kind of uh, um, activities, sustain more sustainable activities uh, in Ecuador too, because Ecuador has a great potential as a lot of uh, Latin America countries with their uh, biodiversity, the, with their uh, cultural diversity. So we have to, I think we have to promote uh, this kind of diversities. We can't uh, ask uh, to these countries to stop fossil fuel extraction without uh, compensating or helping their, uh, their economies. And uh, mainly because the, the uh, Amazon, for example, is a huge sink of uh, carbon sequestration is very important, is fundamental for uh, carbon sequestration. So, uh, and uh, if you want that uh, the forest gone to uh, sequestrate carbon, <coughs> you, you have to uh, compensate in uh, some manner. So. Thank you. Well, we are two minutes late, so we have one minute for, for Claudia, one minute for Fernando. Okay. Um, on the legislation and uh, the framework for around closure, there is very little. The mining code, I think, has like three articles, maybe, that look into it. And basically, it says like you need to have a, a closure plan. Uh, this is not publicly available. Um, it's part of the license contract. That's not something that we can that we can look at. And another important thing here is. Um, um, the liability is only for three years after closure, um, so that's an important thing. There have been discussion about uh, more regulation, but last time I checked, it was not really uh, anywhere. Um, in terms of um, the, the international structures that also make, make it difficult, I think someone mentioned earlier the, the investment protection agreement. I'm not sure that's the exact name, but that's clearly a big, big issue for changing the rules of the game and making extraction more difficult. Um, in terms, and also very important, how much of the revenues are used to service debt. And that's a feedback loop that we need to think about. And the last um, point about uh, Glada's question. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to say what I think they should do, because I have no idea. Honestly, I'm going to say what people said they could do <laughs> uh, at the workshop. And the, the sector that came strongly is agriculture and agro-industry, uh, forestry, and tourism. Now, we can have a whole session about what are the issues with that. Um, 
so we can take it later. And in terms of what would change the, the what could replace the exports and in terms of fiscal revenue, I think Colombia is a very interesting case in terms of fiscal income. They've been trying to improve the fiscal structure for, for many years. There was a big, a big change in in 2016 and uh, basically the main measure was increasing uh, VAT, VAT uh, the IVA, VA, oh, I, I forgot which name, well, the language, um, yes, thank you, <laughs> and uh, fighting, um, um, fighting evasion, uh, but no discussion, for instance, around the massive amount of subsidies to large-scale industry, so that's maybe also a way to look at. Thank you. Thank you. Fernando? Yes, thank you. Uh, let's let's profit from our wealth, and the wealth in, in in Latin America is biodiversity and fresh water. Um, I I always remember the saying of uh, uh, Wilson, the the, bi the, the sociobiologist, uh, who said that he found in in one single tree in El uh, the El Salvador. Uh, a highly uh, uh, well damaged from a point of view of ecology country. In a single tree, he found more uh, ant species than in the entire UK. So that, that's, it's amazing that uh, forty percent of all of the planet species are in South America, let alone Mexico, Caribbean, or Central America, just in, in South America. So we, that, that's part of our heritage. We, we, we are fighting climate change in order to also fight the decay of this extreme wealth that we, we, we are having now. The, my, my second remark, well, there, there is a, a, a paper, instead of getting a full-fledged uh, PowerPoint, I do not believe too much in PowerPoints now, uh, but I, I wrote 15 pages of a paper, and I, I hope that uh, Michael may, may be uh, uh, getting this into, uh, into your, uh, your, your, your web page so that uh, everybody would would have access to it. My final remark is it's the complexity of the situation in Mexico, if in, in Latin America, I think. We, we have a saying that I like. Um, in Mexico, he who is not confused, it's because he is not well informed. <laughs> so if you are well informed, you have the obligation of being confused. And uh, it, it happens with uh, the energy policy, the climate change policy. There are positive aspects, very negative aspects. At the same time, uh, energy vendor, that's, that's good for electricity in Mexico, but uh, you wouldn't find any discussion whatsoever on carbon budgets, for instance, or limitations of uh, supply, or whatever. That, that's not on the agenda right now. So we have lots of uh, reserves of shale, gas, and oil. Uh, whether fracking will be allowed or not, it seems that the new government will not allow uh, for, for fracking, but, but who knows? So be alert. We are on a, on a rough ride now, and uh, everything is possible. But uh, there are also good signs. And uh, what I said about uh, safeguard zones, it's, it was a, a result of uh, a few years of mainstreaming climate change into energy. It's not just... Uh, something uh, at hazard that happened, uh, who knows why. We've been working for, for getting this into the energy uh, area. Uh, okay, that's, uh, that's our uh, playing ground. We, we, we have to fight uh, for, for using uh, every arena that we, we may find to, to get uh, the proper cause is uh, well served. Thanks. Thank you, Fernando.
Fernando. I'd like to thank all here in the, in the table and let's go for lunch.